right now I am about to uh, give the floor to Dr. McKnight from Invite. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Hi, thank you for um, allowing me to to share some of um, our work here. Let me see if I can get this set up. Can you see my screen? Yes, you just have to uh, press the presentation okay. mode. Here we go. And now you can see the presentation mode, correct? Excellent. Yes. Thank That's you. great. Okay. So I um, wanted to to talk a little bit um, about precision therapy for epilepsy um, and and some of the the work we've we've been doing recently. And I really liked this um, image here from um, a recent publication that I think really demonstrates how patients with epilepsy are currently treated and where we think it should go in the future. And is already starting to move in that direction. So um, up top. Typically, when an uh, individual has seizures, um, there's a, a clinical visit and some testing done to see what the type of seizures are the, the patient might have. And then often, based on the type of seizures, just the presentation of seizures, a drug is given. And um, we typically find that the drug is effective in some individuals by reducing or maybe controlling the seizures. But in many individuals, there's, there's really no effect or minimal effect. And what we're seeing is now a shift where not only are you looking at the, the visible type of seizures, but you're starting to, to run genetic testing and, and figure out what is the true etiology of the seizures. Is there a genetic component to the seizures where we, we know exactly what gene went wrong? And then based on that information, we can stratify the treatment um, and actually treat for that etiology of seizures. And we expect that the patients should have better response. Um, not only are you not going through a trial and error of trying a drug, realizing it doesn't work, trying a different drug, you can go straight to the drug that has a better chance of working based on the etiology of the seizures. And the other issue with this, this previous model is not only is there a wait and, and see, and often uh, individuals, their seizures can get worse, or they just um, are trying uh, stacked different kinds of drugs, and a lot of these drugs come with different side effects. So you, you, in some ways, the patient may not have improved seizure control, but might have all these side effects now from these drugs. So really getting the right drug um, for that patient is, is ideal. So the aim of this study um, here at MVT, we investigated changes in clinical management and then subsequent patient outcomes after a definitive genetic diagnosis for epilepsy was made. So that second model where genetics was now incorporated into the clinical care of the patient. And we did this by sending out a survey to um, over 1,500 clinicians that had ordered genetic testing from Invite and had received positive results for their patient. Um, we, we offered a case report um, survey type information to collect uh, from the physician, information about the patient, the treatments, and how they were doing. And we found that just under 11% of the physicians uh, responded to this, this survey and filled out case reports for uh, 429 different patients. So we had information about this patient both before and after the genetic testing results were released. What we found was that um, about half of the time when a, a positive uh, genetic result was returned, the physician was able to use that information and change how they were managing the patient, how they clinically were managing the patient and the therapy. The other half of the time, there, there was no change, but it is important to note that the diagnostic odyssey was ended and we found the, the result for that patient. It's just that that gene finding didn't have any direct changes that the clinician could make. But for half of them, they did make changes. And it was interesting also that in um, over 80% of the times, the physician was able to make that treatment within three months of getting back that result. So pretty quick, timely changes were made based on the genetic finding. The most common change was that a new medication was started or a new medication was added to the medication regimen. Sometimes um, they were able to refer the patient to another specialist because of some other feature that's anticipated with that disease. Um, they'd start monitoring for extra neurological disease. Sometimes they were able to stop a medication with the knowledge that it's not likely to work. 
Um, diet change was also recommended in a small number of cases. A dosage was changed and sometimes even a clinical trial, a, tri a patient was able to enter a clinical trial or a surgery was recommended. But really the most common was the addition of a new um, medication, usually an anti-seizure medication. So this is a busy slide, I'm gonna walk you through it. When a treatment change was made, um, the physician reported that in 75% of the, the cases, there was a positive outcome. So the most common positive outcome was that that 65% of those patients had either reduced or completely eliminated seizures. So this, this precision change to their medication helped to reduce the seizures or in some cases eliminate them. 23% reported other improvements, whether it was in behavior, development, academic, sometimes movement issues. Um, and then 6% uh, reported uh, reduced side effects. So on this image here, we can see the, um, the seizure frequency. At the bottom, this was individuals that were having daily seizures before the diagnosis and treatment change. And in red, we can see that this fraction of individuals went from daily seizures to complete seizure control. And then there was many, all these individuals now have a frequency less than daily seizures. For those who started off with weekly seizures, this is how many went from complete control or to annual seizures. So we see with between the red and this shift in colors, a true reduction in seizures um, or a complete control. And what's interesting to note was, although most of the patients were children, we had a small subset of about 40 patients that were adults, and we saw similar trends in the adults. So not only did the genetics help with the, the precision therapy for children, um, it also helped with adults, and they saw similar benefits in um, improved seizure control. So in conclusion, um, I think we've showed that genetic testing can enable critical uh, clinical management changes that can improve patient outcomes. This was usually in the way of seizure control, and this was true in both adults and children. And we expect that there could be positive health economic implications as individuals with good seizure management incur fewer costs compared to adults with poor seizure management. And I threw in some numbers here based on um, in the US, uh, the 14,000 US dollars compared to 23 US dollars and this 23,000 US dollars. And this is usually because of the, the cost for um, hospitalizations or emergency department visits because of the seizures. So collectively, these data can inform updates to guidelines um, and, and we really should include genetic testing um, in that, that diagnostic workup and the, the treatment management. And we hope that'll help outcomes and reduce healthcare costs. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. McKnight. This was really an impressive presentation with uh, excellent evidence-based data, which definitely will be of use. We are offering the genetic testing for children with epilepsy since a few months in Bulgaria, and we have a pretty good uh, response right now. Thank you very much. I reserve the right to put some questions at the end of the session. The next speaker is Professor Victoria Sarafian from the Plovdiv Medical University. Professor Sarafian, the, the floor is yours. Professor Serafian, if you have any troubles with presentation, we can present instead of you. Um, can you see it? We see the presentation, but you should put it in presentation mode. Right, and do you hear me? Excellent. Fine. So, um, is it okay now? Yes, perfectly. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to participate in this session. Although it is not precisely related to personalized medicine, it uh, will give an um, overview on the link between immunity and autism. 
Um, as I entitled this presentation, it's the invisible link. Because at first glance, as if there is no definite link between immunity and autism. Uh, maybe some of you know that um, autism could be presented in many different ways with various symptoms. And even Miss America for 2012, uh, the Queen of Beauty was a young lady with autism. Actually, nowadays we uh, talk about autism spectrum disorders, uh, which um, are actually uh, involving a number of clinical conditions. There is evidence for the presence of immune dysfunction, neuroinflammation, autoimmunity and allergies that accompany um, autism in uh, most of the cases. It is really a striking news that the number of autistic children is raising rapidly. Uh, more than uh, uh, five million and a half children in the EC are diagnosed with autism, uh, males being four times uh, more in number than the affected females. So there is a very delicate link between the immune system, the central nervous system, the interplay of sex hormones and the gut microbiome, all of them participating in the pathogenesis of this condition. I would focus on immune dysfunction uh, coming from both sides, from the side of the mother and from the side of the affected child. So a lot of factors affect uh, the immune dysfunction in the mother related to the prenatal stress, to the uh, microbiome of the pregnant woman, infections, obesity, autoantibodies and different autoimmune diseases. Um, the HLA genotype of the child, the presence of immune inflammation, the state of the mucosal immunity, also uh, the autoantibodies to brain antigens and defects in neuroimmune signaling um, are contributing to the development of the disease. First, um, I would like to discuss the immune dysfunction of um, the pregnant woman. The prenatal stress is known to affect um, a lot the uh, status of uh, the mother and later on of the newborn. The diet also has to do a lot with that condition. The low intake of folic acid, the high cholesterol diet um, in these ladies or obesity contribute to the birth of uh, affected children. Also, the advanced age of the parents, the short intervals between pregnancies, and the uh, epigenetic changes in some uh, neurotransmitter pathways are um, very important factors which are related to prenatal uh, stress. The microbiome is really important, and there is a lot of evidence showing that um, anxiety alters the microbiome, that the microbiome affects the, my, the myelinization. And there is also a microbial transmission during pregnancy from the mother to um, the child. Of course, um, there are a lot of um, studies on the effect of T cell maturation, the role of T cells in the immune response of the mother towards the child. As a whole, um, male fetuses and uh, newborns, they have stronger immune response in the early childhood, and this leads to prolonged microglial activation, and in fact, neuroinflammation is triggered. All uh, cases of prenatal viral infections associated with fibrillity, especially in the first two trimesters, the release of cytokines and hemokines, they affect the fetal central nervous system. Also, there is a registered transplacental passage of uh, interleukin-6, 
uh, a very active pro-inflammatory cytokine. It is uh, proposed to check the so-called unique mid-gestation of cytokine profile, including interferons and some interleukins in the pregnant woman in order to um, assess the risk of giving birth to an autistic child. Of course, the chronic stress, as we know, as an immunosuppressive uh, state, and also the paradoxical and pro-inflammatory response is uh, very active. Um, during some um, viral infections, there is a reactivation of dormant of latent viruses, uh, which contribute to the permanent state of neuroinflammation. In uh, about 20% of um, the mothers having autistic children, antibodies to fetal brain antigens are discovered and they really persist and uh, affect the central nervous system of the child. The autoimmune diseases of the parents and especially of the mother are also associated to uh, development of autism. Um, diabetes type 1 and hypothyroidism um, in the father and a number of other autoimmune diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, celiac disease, um, um, systemic lupus erythematosus and others uh, contribute also to accompanying clinical symptoms related to autism. For example, uh, congenital heart blocks are observed in autistic children having mothers with systemic lupus. As a whole, there is an impaired immune regulation in the mother. Um, the developing blood brain barrier allows the access to uh, fetal brains of autoantibodies coming from the mother, and the inflammation alters placental function and brain function as well. As far as the immune dysfunction of the child is concerned, there is uh, the importance of the HLA genotype of uh, some molecules participating in the antigenic presentation during the immune response, like the MHC class 1 molecules, and this uh, long-lasting immune inflammation due to the altered balance between pro- and anti-inflammatory cytokines with the prevalence of the pro-inflammatory state. Mucosal immunity is usually accompanied with um, IgA deficiency. In these children, um, a number of gastrointestinal problems, local inflammation in the gut, and um, there is evidence that improvement after diet and anti-inflammatory treatment is observed in these children. Of course, autoantibodies to brain antigens are also considered. Also, their direct role is still quite controversial. In uh, most children, there is a defect in a neuroimmune signaling pathways. The brain volume is increased, the number of um, active neurons is decreased, and uh, a very interesting fact is that some basic neurotransmitters like uh, GABA and glutamate, they have as their um, function also immune modulation. There are receptors for these neurotransmitters on the lymphocytes. So antibodies to these receptors affect the clinical symptoms either a motor dysfunction or convulsions, depending on the receptor which is targeted. And finally, um, the therapeutic perspectives um, involve a number of um, drugs, which usually are combined, as there is no one till now which is considered to be definitely effective. Uh, opiate antagonists, immunomodulators, high doses of vitamin D, considered also as an immunomodulator, also um, intravenous 
um, immunoglobulin injections, um, the diet, the probiotics, and also it is considered a recolonization with gut microflora, which could um, improve the symptoms in autistic children. As a whole, uh, the, the topic is uh, much more complicated than I tried to present it uh, in this brief um, on, um, in this brief presentation because um, the, the invisible link between immunity and autism seems to become more and more visible as uh, molecular biology techniques, uh, precision medicine, pharmacogenetics and genomics develop and they alter new uh, technologies and new insights. And um, as we know, everything in Everything that is visible comes from the invisible world. Once we master the techniques to, to see. And uh, uh, finally, I would like to cite a, a romantic uh, poet, Emily Dickinson, saying that the brain is wider than the sky. And I really do believe that we have a lot to learn about our brain, how it functions, and how the links inside are connected and finally, how we can improve uh, all conditions related to um, deficient function of the brain. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Professor Serafian, for this inspiring lecture. Indeed, the brain is larger than the sky. That's true. Uh, the next speaker, Diana Barca, Dr. Barca, please, the floor is yours. You hear me? Yes, we hear you and we see your presentation, but not in presentation mode. Yeah, I know, I know. It will be. Excellent. Yes. Okay, it was great now, to hear. Now everything's fine. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Uh, it, it was wonderful to hear the previous presentation. I uh, used the invitation to present here uh, like a manifesto from the point of view of a pediatric neurologist. And some dem I'm starting with some demographical data to explain my, my presentation because I'm coming from a country with uh, 19 million inhabitants where we have around 200,000 newborns per year. Some of these newborns will have neurological disorders. I work in the largest pediatric neurology clinic in the country with more than 3,000 of admission per year, and we are already this expertise. But despite all these beautiful numbers, we have limited metabolic and genetic test availability in Romania. They are not supported by health insurance. We only have a few networks and only a few specialists are now arising from the healthcare background. So when I'm talking about my field, I'm talking about a very complex pediatric specialty because we have the childhood particularity. The child is evolving, it's developing. So we are going to have evolutive clinical pictures and in a neurological disorder in childhood, we most of the time have the coexistence of multiple impairments in the same child. So we have this, since we are resident, we have this constant need to find the etiology of the targeted treatment as early as possible. And when we are in a clinical practice, we have three main questions in front of a neurological patient. What is happening? And this is referring to etiology, to uh, semiology, where is happening, it means I have to establish a topographical diagnostic. And the most important question is why is happening? And this is where the precision medicine is needed. I don't think, except maybe the cancers, so it's the precision medicine is developing more in another field than in pediatric neurology. We think it's in the field of diagnostic and treatment. And we are talking about the new technology that are helping every day. The DNA sequencing has changed a lot in the past years. 
the face of pediatric neurology, all the omics that are now evolving, the metabolomics, proteomics, lipidomics, and so on. The imaging techniques, which is a wonder that the MRIs of three Tesla, seven Tesla are doing, but also the developing of all the other means of investigations and the new devices and gadgets. And all these are leading to new findings. So we improve our clinical practice by translating all the research into practice and we discover new disorders and we try, we learn to recognize new disorders after they've been published and discovered by researchers and also new treatments and new improvements in therapy decision monitoring. So I think precision medicine in pediatric neurology is almost a standard of practice. And if we are thinking about epilepsy and the first talk was great because it was exactly what I was going to say, but also in neuromuscular disorders, if I think of Duchenne, spinal muscular atrophy, but we see precision medicine applied in neurodegenerative metabolic disorders, in brain malformation, and all these global developmental delays with unidentified etiology until now. So I thought to give just a few examples how we are using precise medicine in everyday life. So if I'm talking about this case, it was the second child of a family born prematurely, which could be, it, it looked okay in the first days of life, but 48 hours, hours of life, he started to present seizures. And the seizures, they did not respond to anything, to the barbital, the vitrocetam, vitamins. So the MRI was performed, the MRI was completely normal, and then the EEG showed the suppression burst, and then evolved to a multifocal aspect. So we were thinking it must be a genetic epilepsy. So in this case, the genetic testing was done, and the child proved to be a KCN TP mutation, which means that we could add carbamazepine in his treatment, and the outcome was very good with teaser controlled almost immediately. And the second case with a beautiful girl who's no personal history until the age of seven years, six years when epilepsy started, that it could not be stopped with any combination of drugs. And the MRI was normal, so we could not understand what was happening until a best EEG was performed, a better EEG, and the ictal video EEG showed the consistent left frontal focal onset. But at the, the age of 10 years, we could perform in Romania, a three Tesla MRI, and the two Tesla MRI showed what the video EG was trying to tell us, that she had an abnormality in the left frontal lobe, and it was a focal cortical dysplasia, so the child was referred to epilepsy surgery, and the evolution was great because she was operated and she's seizure-free, and now she's winning off some of the medication. So the better imaging technique helps the treatment. And if we are thinking about new classification of epilepsy, we look that the former idiopathic, which means good but unknown or cryptogenic, the terms that were used in former classification, now are better defined as genetic and structural and metabolic, which means we need this technological means, a better one, to be able to define better one epilepsy. Because when we are talking about epilepsy, we are talking about a disorder that is affecting up to 1% of the population. So there are a few million people, children and grown-ups with epilepsy. And we are talking about epilepsy, we are talking about an umbrella, a heterogeneous group of conditions with recurrent seizure, for which we only have symptomatic treatment. So the drugs, the anti-seizure drugs, they are limited in limited number despite the fact that it had different mechanisms, here's the genetic. And I think it's a good example of how genetics and pediatric neurology in this precision medicine development, they are going and growing together. Genetic testing available on a large scale led to changing of all we knew about epilepsies and the genetic result in first treatment and improve patient care as the first speaker so beautifully showed and demonstrated. But then we move to neuromuscular disorders and it's great that muscular dystrophy, the most frequent one, Duchenne muscular, progressive muscular dystrophy, which is an excellent recessive disorder. Yes, and with precision medicine started, they say anecdotically, with a discovery of dystrophy gene and its mechanism. And if we are talking about Duchenne nowadays, we are talking about Translavna, so Ataluren, the first approved treatment for the underlying etiology, aiming at the molecular level. So for the nonsense mutation DVD, uh, we have a treatment now because the nonsense mutation will lead to the appearance of a premature stop codon 
at the messenger RNA level, and this premature stop codon will cause disease by interrupting translation just before generating a full length protein, which is exactly what Translarna allows. It allows to read the ribosomal proteins containing such a premature stop codon, so it will lead to a full length protein. What's the meaning for the little patient? Well, it will stabilize or improve even the physical function, which means we could climb better, walk better, can use gadgets better. Some of the boys, they can swim as they can take care of themselves better than before. So it's a beautiful example about how science was helping finding the treatment. But even if we move to terrible neurodegenerative disorders, this is a personal case of mine, a girl whom I know, I knew when she was three years old and she was referred for global mental delay with some expressive language and some autistic features. But immediately after I met her, seizures started and she was mildly ataxic and clumsy. Uh, no regression, but though it was something was not good with her, so the EEG was highly abnormal despite only two seizures. And we see the MRI, which the radiologist described as being normal. We consider it showed some mild cerebral atrophy. So we were thinking in this little girl with global mental delay, mainly on cognition level, with two seizures, but highly abnormal EEG and ataxia, if it would be genetic or metabolic. So at that age, we decided to make a whole exome sequencing, which showed a mutation in TPP1 gene, confirming a terrible diagnostic of neuronal steroid lipofuscinosis type 2, so CLN2. It was in 2017, it was the year when in Europe, the treatment for this disorder was approved. So she was one of the first children who benefit of enzyme replacement treatment prior to the intracerebral ventricular. And actually, this is her radiography showing uh, how she is getting, even now, every two weeks, the enzyme showing some stabilization in a terrible disorder. Because as we know, the CLNs, they are disease in which the children might be normal in the beginning, and they, they just present standstill milestone, and then regression with epilepsy, dementia, ataxia, and premature death in, in this disease, in this type of CLN, they live up to, they were, they, they used to live until 12 years, at most, but now with the new treatment, we see how these children are stabilizing. So new disorders, a new history of this disease is writing, has been written right now. So with these examples, I wanted to highlight how identifiers for genetic testing and epilepsy etiology would lead to an early diagnostic, correct treatment and good outcome. With better imaging, identify the epilepsy etiology, so offer to the child another treatment that genetic diagnostic is allowing a specific treatment and that the rapid diagnostic before the full picture was there allowed early intervention to modify the evolution. So I think pediatric neurology is a main area of precision medicine. Because it's only with thorough genetic assessment that we are growing every day, that we need to center the patient, we need to care about the patient, but we need to continue research and education. And I think this was my view, as the patient is here, we are the clinicians and we have to be to stick together because each patient, each pediatric patient, needs a multidisciplinary approach and all the clinicians should be rapidly and well-connected researcher and the researcher should work in networks. And for this, the European reference networks, we are all part of it's helping each of these, our countries grow. So why is precision medicine good in pediatric neurology? Because it allows, it improves quality of life for little patients because it's ch and it's changing natural course of known disease. And as my previous talk said, the speaker said, it reduced the health forecast of this cost of these children whom we used to investigate a lot until we find we would find a diagnostic. But we don't, we should not forget that the patient is already in the center, that we need multidisciplinarity, we need to collaborate and to cooperate. So from the frustration of a pediatric neurologist in a country with limited research, or limited technologies, let's say, at a mass level, I think networking is essential in order to equal chances despite technological background that it's so different from country to country. And networking is needed also to be up to date as progresses in the medical fields are so rapid and increasing, we need to stick together in order to grow together in uh, the quality of knowledge. And the precision medicine, I think, is a direction towards which healthcare is definitely evolving.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I did enjoy your lecture and apparently you speak from your heart, which I like very much as a <laughs> former physician. Thank you very much, Dr. Barker. I have two questions for the audience. Um, actually, uh, this topic was partially uh, covered by Dr. Barka, but also I would like to ask the other participants. Um, the main topic of our atelier this year is the patient centricity. So, how do you see the patient centricity in personalized neurology? And let me start with uh, Dr. McKnight. Um, so the question is, how are the patients going to participate in um, precision medicine? Yes, what's the role of the patients? Because we are speaking uh, a lot about patient centricity and uh, we know that the patients play a crucial role in drug development, in uh, biomarker development. What's your position about this and how yeah. in is this? I think it's really, really important, at least in the, the United States, the, the advocacy, the patient advocacy groups are playing a really major role in, in exactly this because um, I, I see a lot of the really well-organized advocacy groups are basically not only a conduit for the patients, but for the pharma and they're active when it comes to going to the FDA to get drugs approved. And I think for a lot of these rare conditions, um, understanding the natural history is really important and, and going to be vital to getting any of these therapies approved by the regulators. And this is where these the patient and, and the aggregate of patients through an advocacy group are so important in helping to get enough patients uh, for the trials for rare disease and then also the information around the natural history to show that that drug even has a positive effect. Very good. Thank you very much. Dr. Barker, once again, what do you think about the role of patients in personalized neurology? Well, I think they are vital. So I think what we try to keep the parent association, the patient association, well, in my case, the parent association together, and we need them for the registry. Because in countries like my own, where we don't have the means to have all these beautiful stuff, we have to organize uh, the pathologies in registries, in able to be able to, to uh, cooperate with uh, expertise centers abroad. So, as we tell our re residents, we have to know very well. We have to be up to date, even if we cannot do that test or this one. We have to keep our children close, and we have uh, we have started at national level with a uh, parents advocacy group just to talk to them and to try to convince them. So we have some examples for some pathology for blood one deficiency, for example, where the parents became very active uh, for some. Uh, neurodegenerative disorder, and this is for the, uh, well, SMA and the Duchenne, which, where the parents are very, let's say, uh, up to, to, to with the information. So, I think, yes, we have to put the patient, me, the pneumologist, the pediatrician, the orthopedist, but also we have to think of the knowledge, so we have to keep, uh, uh, to talk to them and to make uh, partners. So, the patient association, they have to make partnership with the uh, healthcare. Been able to develop further. Excellent. Thank you very much. This is excellent. excellent. Professor Serafian, what do you think about the role of the patient? Of course, I would say. not overestimate their role in the personalized neurology development? Uh, no, uh, I think that uh, patients, and especially in the case of autism, their parents should be aware of the research that is going on, the new drug discoveries, the elucidation of new pathogenic mechanisms, and to be ready to participate in such preclinical and research projects that would open the perspectives for further personalization of therapy. So, awareness we all agree that the there. patients have a crucial role. And the next question is related to one of the other big topics. Uh, where will be the healthcare in 2030? So, how do you think where will be the personalized neurology in 2030? Professor Sarafian, what's your answer? Um, I think it should go to uh, molecular mechanisms to the deciphering of the molecules and pathways participating in uh, the disease development and from there on to uh, the discovery of um, new drugs 
and new genes that are responsible for the uh, answer to therapy. So I, I hope and I see that molecular medicine is the pathway for this further personalization. Excellent. Barca, what do you think? Well, I think in uh, that many years, we will probably treat genetic disorders before they start to appear. I, I mean, the team of uh, <laughs> genetics developing because I think we see even now that the genetic therapies are beginning to emerging. So I think we will teach more and more. Probably there'll be new challenges, challenges now then when we will know more about our genetic information. But I think uh, we will change the history of the disorders will be changed. We'll probably face new disorders and we will treat completely different to these ones. So, Thank you, Dr. McKnight. You have the privilege to close this topic. That's great. Yeah, I agree with all the other speakers. It is hard to predict where it'll be in 10 years because I'm not sure we would have predicted where we are right now 10 years ago. But I, I do think that we're going to have a better understanding of genetic conditions, not just the monogenetic, but really the more complex ones and even maybe ones where the genetics and the environment really come together. I hope we have a better understanding. I hope that we are able to catch them before the disease even manifests and that the treatments can change the natural history of the course of the disease for that patient for, for better outcomes. I, I think we'll see that for a, a lot of diseases within the next 10 years. Well, that's a bright future, what you foresee. Thank you very much. Now I can say that this, this was one of the most uh, interesting panels for today.